I'll wait for I uh, get the go from our tech department because uh, <laughs> ah I guess uh, I guess that means uh, that means I'm uh, I'm okay uh, so yeah welcome uh, welcome to this uh, this meetup um, in collaboration between uh, Polymec and uh, Web3 Foundation uh, so yeah tonight we'll go through a few different things um, we'll talk a bit about uh, the latest development on uh, on Polymec what's been going on in the last uh, weeks and, uh, and months. Uh, and, then, uh, and then we will dive into uh, much more uh, updates on, uh, on Polkadot. And we will also have uh, a panel to dive a bit more into some of these uh, very uh, interesting things that's going on on, uh, on, on Polkadot with, uh, with very um, specific names. So uh, whoever knows about Beefy, if, uh, if you don't know about it now, then you'll know about it when we are done here. Um, yeah, so apparently there's a remote for the, um, not that I have a lot of slides, because uh, I think you, it's, uh, slides are good, but you probably want to hear it a bit more, and I think also if there are questions, then uh, please, just, uh, please just let me know, happy to, uh, happy to dive into a bit more of the um, details. Ah, excellent. So, first of all, March for, for Polymec has been uh, quite busy. I think uh, everybody was sort of like, how, how is it going? And uh, usually the default answer is like, uh, busy. Um, which has been busy for, for some months, but definitely for, for March has been, uh, has been quite busy. Um, so, governance uh, is, uh, is here now for, for Polymec. Uh, we launched that um, so that now everyone that's a, that's a token holder on Polymic, can actually vote, have an influence on, uh, on what's going on. Uh, we have implemented, uh, for the ones who are into to Polkadot, we have basically implemented the, the same version as what is known as Gov1. Uh, so, uh, so we do have self-executable governance on, uh, on Polymic, so the token holders decide. But we also do have uh, an on-chain council 
uh, that's voted for by the by the token holder and uh, and is uh, is changed out over time. So the token holders can actually vote for the uh, for the members of the on-chain council as well. That also means that uh, pseudo is gone uh, because having on-chain uh, having full self-executable on-chain governance doesn't really make sense if you are sitting with some kind of multi-sig or something where you can just decide everything on your own anyway. So the so having Backend access or pseudo access to the chain is now is now gone. That's uh, fully uh, managed by the um, by by the by the governance setup. So basically, that means that what Polymeg is right now is Polymeg is a fully decentralized uh, token. The tokens is uh, transferable. What happens when the tokens become transferable is that obviously some people want to transfer it. Uh, which is uh, now possible and is also possible without doing its OTC. Um, but it also means that now we're actually ready to start doing what Polymec is supposed to be doing, which is uh, on-chain fundraising. And that's why our app launch is, uh, is going to happen very, very soon. Uh, if you're looking at it, it will be at some point uh, next month. Now this one stopped working again. <laughs> no? Ah, so for the, for the app, obviously where the, the app as such, so for, for the ones of you who have actually been, been looking at it, the app is actually live, but right now what you do in the app is that you can actually do governance and you can do the uh, staking of your, your Polymac tokens. What, uh, what we will be able to do in, in April is that we can actually start the actual first fundraisers on, uh, on Polymec. So make sure that you're ready with your Polymec tokens and also with whatever tokens you would like to, uh, to use for the, uh, for the first fundraisers, which in uh, most cases will be USDT, USDC, uh, which runs on, uh, on, uh, on Polkadot, so there's some... Uh, there's a way of actually getting Polkadot native USDT or USDC for, for participating. So once we get closer, we will actually let all of you know a bit more about how to actually do that, how to get the, uh, how to get the Polkadot native USDT and USDC so you can participate in the, uh, in the fundraisers. Now we'll try again. Now I also need to switch the page, so maybe that's... Yeah, so participating in fundraising rounds, uh, talking a bit about sort of where we are. Um, a lot is coming um, and a lot of very, very interesting projects. So currently we are talking to more than 40 different uh, Web3 startups uh, on figuring out how do they actually do the fundraise most effective, how can they actually use Polymec and how can they use Polymec to, uh, to decentralize and raise funds for the, uh, for the projects they've been working on. The good thing here is that all the ones we're talking to, or at least a lot of the ones we're talking to, are what you'd call like bear market survivors, or it's the ones that are still around. So it's all the ones that have actually been building continuously through the bear market that really are the Web3 builders and actually want to build products on Web3 uh, to, to make a, a more Web3 native uh, way of, uh, of interacting with the, um, with the chain. So, so very, very... Uh, senior uh, builders, but also builders that know a lot about Polkadot. Um, and we also engage in quite a lot with the Polkadot community, also participating on the, um, on the Polkadot Blockchain Academy, talking to a lot of the founders and all the developers there as well, to actually be an active part of the community, see what is actually happening, and also talk about how do you actually do a proper decentralized uh, launch of your, of your project, and how can you utilize uh, Polymec as a part of that to make sure you can actually raise funds in a compliant and, uh, and decentralized way. And the best part of it is that you can all be a part of it or everybody can be a part of it, which is very much the core thesis of why we actually built uh, Polymec in the first place because fundraising is always sort of, you need to know someone who knows someone and then, ah, oh, they're doing something and maybe they're doing a fundraising round. So maybe I can participate if I know the right guy that knows one, one that I can call someone. Which, sure, if you know someone, it's probably good. If you don't, it's very, very difficult, right? 
So then you don't have access, and what we want to do is actually democratize the access to early stage fundraising on the most exciting projects in, uh, in Web3. So that means you can be a part of it with all our different uh, collaboration partners. So we are now uh, in collaboration with quite a lot of different uh, companies. I think some of the ones who have been here before knows about uh, Deloitte, obviously Web3 Foundation, Polkadot, and so on. Uh, Kills, but also um, now we talked about Polkadot Blockchain Academy. We have a Little Studio that is responsible for everything looking great, together with uh, our front-end developer, Felix, as well. Um, and a lot of our infrastructure providers as well, like uh, Amfork. I think the last time at our meetup, we talked about Subscript and how anyone that actually successfully raises funds on, uh, on Polymake also gets, uh, gets a benefit of actually getting a nice uh, package from, uh, from Subsquid to make sure that you have, uh, have the right setup for, for starting out. So this is basically what Polymake is all about. Um, like all of you can become the VC. It's not like the VC is like uh, some uh, magical guy in a vest somewhere, uh, a Patagonia vest, by the way, of course. Uh, but everybody can actually be the VC. So everybody can take part, and everybody can decide what they want to what they want to take part in, how much they want to take part of the of the project, and you can do it fully decentralized with the full Web3 narrative, regulatory compliant, with a decentralized uh, KYC on everything that you're doing. So a complete new way of doing, of doing fundraising, but still doing it completely Web3 narrative, uh, but, uh, but with, the, um, with the full uh, decentralized chain behind it. So that was a lot about uh, Polymec, what we've been doing for the last, uh, last month, month and a half. Uh, a lot of things has happened. Um, yeah, I'm not going to say sort of what happened this week, but uh, I guess some of you know. Uh, if you don't, then you can see it on CoinMarketCap and soon on, oh, on CoinGecko, soon on CoinMarketCap as well. Uh, but um, I think I will now leave it over to uh, Rada to give some insights into what's been going on in the world of, uh, of Polkadot, uh, which of course we are a member of. So. We are keenly following whatever is going on, um, utilizing all the greatest uh, new tech in the, uh, in the ecosystem, which is uh, challenging, but also what is actually enabling us to do what we're doing on, on Polymec and doing fully decentralized uh, compliant fundraising. Okay, um, so welcome to the Polkadot update session. I'm Radha Dasari. I'm the technical education lead at Web3 Foundation. <clears throat> so March, we saw a lot of updates in, in Polkadot ecosystem. Our flagship developer conference happened in Bangkok uh, last week. Yeah, last week, and then a lot of new uh, updates or, <clears throat> you know, technical roadmaps were, were uncovered. The first one was about Jam, like Core Jam, uh, presented by Gavin Wood. A lot to unpack. Honestly, like I'll take a, a week more time to unpack it and then sort of, you know, give more insight in the next update. For now, <clears throat> all of these videos are, are available on Polkadot Events channel on YouTube, so you can, um, you know, get, get a first-hand info from Gav in that video about Core Jam. Okay. Uh, in short, it's going to let uh, this new chain, uh, vision for like Polkadot, um, to host any sort of arbitrary program, allow para chains to work as usual, uh, and so on and so forth. Anyway, so we had like uh, Web3 Foundation researchers talk about zero knowledge on, on like Polkadot and, and the advances. We had data availability on, on Polkadot, so that's the most happening you know, buzzword in, in Web3 right now, making data available. We had like few parachain teams uh, discuss about transferring NFTs via XCM. So this is like a cross-chain transfer of NFT. So it's almost like transferring <clears throat> the NFT itself, not just the ownership, from one chain to the other chain. 
We had uh, an update about generic ledger app. So right now, Polkadot has 50 parachains uh, and Polkadot Relay Chain itself, one app to you know, sort of access uh, assets on like every blockchain out there in the ecosystem. So that's possible with this generic ledger app. Um, yeah, so we also have like better, um, you know, TypeScript support for, for building apps on Polkadot. There's a lot of gaming buzz on Polkadot as well, given its, its, um, its technical capability. You can build like really performant gaming applications on it. So we have a Polkadot Unity SDK integration live right now. Asset tokenization and fractionalization. So it's the follow-up of last uh, month's update that I've given. On Asset Hub, you're able to fractionalize like NFTs and, and you know, tokenize like assets there. And many, many more. So take a look at that. And if you're like a Polkadot enthusiast and, and you want to know what's happening on the network, so the latest integration we had is with Dune. So you can see a lot of blockchain analytics of Polkadot as well as its chains uh, available there for you uh, to look at. I would say uh, if you're interested in, in governance, there's like an open gov governance dashboard. If you're interested in network staking, there's a staking dashboard and, and many more. It also hosts a lot of parachains as well. More chains to be integrated in Dune soon. Okay, so the topic for today, so Polymec is sort of launching its app in, in April, so it's very timely for what we are doing here as well. Uh, hopefully the bridges that, that we are rolling out on Polkadot will bring a lot of liquidity into Polkadot ecosystem from other ecosystems, uh, mainly Ethereum. So let's see what's enabling that sort of transfer you know, of assets from other ecosystems. So we have what's called a Polkadot Bridge Hub. So it's a, basically a, a blockchain, it's a system chain on Polkadot has been live since last year, 300 days, um, launched in 2023. So what it does is it enables trustless bridges, right? So we're not talking about bridges that are operated with multi-sigs, not bridges that, that uh, you know, are running code without any sort of audits. So here we're talking about trustless bridging of, of two, two different protocols. So, so this, uh, so we, we have like a panel that, that's gonna delve deeper into what, how you design them and, and how, what security guarantees they have. But again, like BridgeHub is the place where you host these trustless bridge uh, protocols. So we have Polkadot Kusama bridge, um, you know, code sort of shipped, and then we have Polkadot Ethereum bridge, which we are gonna talk about uh, soon. And one good thing about this uh, BridgeHub is that it's not, a privately owned like blockchain, it's a system chain. Any sort of changes on that blockchain go through like Polkadot OpenGov. So they have to be voted by a broader, uh, you know, segment of dot uh, holders. Uh, and yeah, so the latest update about Polkadot Kusama Bridge. Uh, so this tweet is from today. Uh, and then within next 24 hours, this OpenGov proposal is, is gonna um, be, uh, confirmed and then it'll be executed soon. So what this is gonna bring is, yeah, so basically for bridges to work, like trustless bridges to work, you need a light client of the other protocol running on this one. So Polkadot will, will run a light client of Kusama and Kusama is already running a light client of Polkadot. Both of these different blockchains are gonna interact with each other through, through this update. Yeah, so, it's not just BridgeHub. So Polkadot has about 50 parachains. Even the parachains can choose to host like bridge protocols on them, just that it is governed by, by those parachain teams and not by the broader Polkadot OpenGov. So we have Interlay, which is uh, the most decentralized Bitcoin bridge out there. So I, I would ask you to like check it out if you're interested in like Bitcoin and, and DeFi around it. There's also a, a bridge to Cosmos uh, done by Composable, and there are many other projects uh, which, which are trying to bridge like different ecosystems together, like Near, uh, Avalanche, and, and others, which are spearheaded by the parachain teams. Like here, some liquidity from Solana. Yeah, sure. Uh, we have somebody getting liquidity from Solana here. So yeah, plenty of projects. I couldn't list all of them here. 
and then we have like like uh, uh, hyperbridge so which which is also taking this to to the next level with some zero knowledge uh, implementations for for these bridges and this ties into the panel as well they are going to use this bridge efficiency enabling finality yielder or beefy shortly uh, to to sort of do to what they're trying to do and how far are we on on polka dot so right now this was taken yesterday uh, there were like 68.35 people uh, Tugi is disappointed so so I hope validators if you're looking at this this presentation it's time for you to you know enable the the beefy uh, keys and and yeah. Um, and regarding, okay, so beefy is, is a protocol, right? It's, it's the end of the day, it's like a protocol that uh, enables you to um, know what's happening on, on Polkadot or, or Kusama or any sort of like, like chain that is using RANPA uh, based finality. But what can be built on top of it? So, so Snowbridge is one of those implementations which is trying to use this beefy to bridge to Ethereum. So basically you implement uh, a light client of Polkadot on Ethereum side, and on Polkadot you already have like light client of Ethereum, and they both have to like talk to each other. Uh, so this Snowbridge implementation, this is a mega PR. So if you look at it, 389 commits have been made since like, uh, when was that, like December 2023. Uh, finally, today, like I think there was a final approval for this, so soon this is going to be merged, and Snowbridge will actually be, uh, you know, live soon, I guess. Um, and with that, I would like to transition to the, the panel discussion right now to, to give you more understanding of um, trustless bridges, what's beefy, when beefy, and so on and so forth. So I invite Alistair, Stewart, who is like the lead uh, researcher of Web3 Foundation. Uh, Rob, who has been, yep. So Rob Hambrock, who has implemented part of like, like Beefy, uh, and then Bargov, who is currently like auditing or has already audited like, like the, uh, you know, working of, of uh, the bridges and, and Beefy. So thank you, welcome. Uh, I think you can take it, you, okay. you can keep it, yeah. Okay, so I, I know the title is, is When Beefy, so this, this was a meme, uh, very popular in the community, uh, but actually When Beefy was, was already like six months ago, right? So, so Beefy was already shipped six months ago, so this is an old meme. Uh, today we'll be focusing more on, on why Beefy and, and what is Beefy. So I'll start with uh, Bargo. Uh, just repeat uh, to, to the audience what you mentioned to me this afternoon. <laughs> you know, uh, okay, so I, I already gave the, uh, you know, expansion of Beefy, right? It's a bridge efficiency enabling finality yielder. Fine, but in your own words for the audience, uh, let us know what Beefy is. Sure, so when I talk to people from the community, I sense that there is like, a sense of confusion on what exactly beefy is. So beefy in like general usage is like an overloaded term, right? So it really has like two components to it. One is uh, the beefy finality gadget, which is basically an, another layer of finality on top of Grandpa, which makes it easier for light clients to follow the consensus on Polkadot. And the other component is like the the, the light client protocol itself, like how do you listen to the finality that is happening on Polkadot, right? And here there are like different approaches for uh, like implementing this protocol. One of them is the random sampling approach. So this is like an interactive random sampling approach which was like uh, researched at the foundation and is basically powering the, the snow bridge, uh, Polkadot Ethereum bridge. Actually there are like uh, different versions or like a more advanced version with like snark based light clients also. So yeah, the way I see it is like, it's basically two components. One is just like the finality gadget, which makes it easier. And the other is like the light client protocol itself. Okay, I'll cut you right there. So yeah. just for normal people out there. So, 
So what Bhargav is trying to explain here is, um, so Polkadot or, or any other blockchain has a way of finalizing transactions, right? So Bitcoin, it's like probabilistic. You have to wait for two hours or three hours to be absolutely sure that nobody can, can revert that transaction. So on Polkadot, we have Grandpa, which gives finality to the transactions. The author of Grandpa is right there. So, so it so happens that on Polkadot, like in 20 seconds, like, like the transactions are sort of final. Uh, so this finality, if you want to prove it to other chains, like it's, it's going to be expensive. So how do you make it cheaper for other protocols to understand what's happening on Polkadot? So that's where like beefy protocol was sort of designed, right? So, so now we're talk, talking about very light clients, like light clients that can actually run in probably browsers uh, or like, you know, uh, computers that have very limited like, like hardware, they're able to understand what's happening on Polkadot like efficiently. Um, or or and the most compute intense, uh, restricted platform is like another chain, right? So like on-chain. Yes, exactly. Yeah. On-chain, uh, yeah. so, different chain. so we have again like, like the design and architect of, of Wi-Fi. So yeah, we, we, we could gra verify Grandpa on, on another chain. This is exactly how the Polkadot Kusama bridge is going to work. Right. Um, but we couldn't do it on Ethereum. It would be way too expensive. Um, there's, there's issues, we, we're not using the right cryptography for Ethereum. Um, so we can easily verify it on another substrate chain because parachains are very powerful. Um, compared to uh, what you can do on Ethereum. And you have to use the right cryptography, the thing that you have pre-compiles for. And uh, at some point, it was just easier to specifically target Ethereum because like, you know, there's a lot of Ethereum's that are obviously the most valuable thing to bridge to. And, and then there's a million other chains that use the EVM. Um, this thing's gonna be easier for other light clients, but Ethereum was a, a specific target and the design decisions we made for Grandpa were just wrong, so we had to add something else. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, to expand on that, I think the problem here is like like on the uh, cost reduction on Ethereum side. So on Polkadot, we already have the efficient way of like verifying uh, proofs uh, for finality. So on Ethereum, like it, it's very costly to sort of um, implement that uh, mainly. And yeah, you have something to add, Rob. Well, like you've really mapped it, like especially after Altsburg, I think everything has been mapped up pretty well. But the, so the, um, maybe like for comparison with like other bridges, um, so the, uh, the, the, the random subsampling, like the, the subsampling here is really like a unique feature of Beefy that one does this uh, to still have a safe protocol while only having to verify a subset of the, uh, uh, the two thirds of signatures that you'd usually have to verify. Uh, and this doesn't use some delay like in the, in the bridge itself which you can, um, because, especially because of Randall, because you have to wait, because like this uh, um, uh, entropy could be biased. Um, you can kind of, but similarly, like other trustless bridge designs, especially like the optimistic ones, have similar kind, well, for different reasons, they have this kind of delay, uh, just because you have, you have the challenge period where somebody submits a result and then this can be challenged. Um, yeah. Specifically in this, so, so Rainbow are a bit near, use the same type of signatures as in Grandpa, they have fewer validators, they, they, they only have 100. And their approach was optimistic. We put all the signatures on chain, but we cannot verify 100 signatures in Ethereum. So we have to challenge them if they're wrong because it's so expensive. And the problem is you can censor Ethereum. Um, to some extent, sometimes transaction fees are high, transactions are expensive, and no one is going to post this challenge, which is very expensive to verify. Um, unless they, you know, unless they, they got enough reward and things like this and, and um, it turns out, you know, like if, if you guys think if, uh, blockchains can't be censored, you should uh, Google FOMO 3D on Ethereum. Like even in Ethereum at the, at the top of the value with, with its expensive thing, it's, it's possible to buy up all the gas uh, for several, uh, several blocks. And the results of, uh, to deal with this, like Mia had to put in a delay of eight hours. So you're trying to put an asset onto, from Polkadot to, to, from Mia to, to Ethereum, it would take eight hours to wait for the bridge to verify it, uh, Nia's finality, and we didn't want that. Um, but we could have gone ZK. So, so Avail, uh, amazingly, independent of us, like, they, you know, they, 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 they were going stealth at, um, when they were part of Polygon. 
uh, they did a ZK, uh, a snark that does that does grandpa, and this this would almost work. But it, even if you have this, it's still difficult to show something happens on polka dots. It still doesn't use the right cryptography for anything, um, and they probably have. Okay, so is it, does anyone ever know how what their proving time is? Probably it's hours. I don't. I never actually looked into this. Uh, this is probably some delay. Uh, and it needs someone to come along and prove it. We need someone who has all this computation. It's a bit centralized. So we could have gone with you know, either of these approach, but instead we decided to add an extra layer to make things good for light clients. Yeah, so let's zoom out a, a little bit on, on this, um, just to give more context on what was explained right now. So first of all, like trustless bridge design is, is, is like very challenging, right? So that's why most of the bridges you see they have some form of like uh, you know a central point of, of failure. Um, so designing a trustless bridge in itself is complex. That's why you're you're hearing a lot of complex terminology here. Um, part of like what Alistair mentioned was um, about this Avail people. Uh, so Avail is like co-founded by uh, founded by a Polygon uh, blockchain co-founder. So they've used like Polkadot SDK to to build like a data availability. Uh, blockchain called, called Avail, it's launching pretty soon. So they have contributed back to like Polkadot SDK with, with this uh, sort of like ZK based like, like client. Um, so that's one approach and then uh, the approach that we chose was what, what Alistair uh, mentioned right here. Um, but yeah, so you mentioned something about they taking like eight hours, so what's the timing that an implementation using like beefy, like Snowbridge, how long does it take for assets to be transferred from, from Ethereum, and when can you be absolutely sure that the asset is transferred? Okay, how many epochs is it, two, four? It's four. Four, so that's 26 minutes? I think, yeah, so I think it takes, uh, the, the current random sampling implementation will take 26 minutes. Yeah, that's uh, probably the fastest trustless fastest than, design than out there. Yeah. We could use snarks, and, and if we got our snarks, like we, if we didn't try and snark grandpa, which is probably gonna take a very long time, if we tried to design beefy specifically so that you could create a snark, um, we can probably get that down to a, few, to a couple of minutes probably. Couple of minutes. Yes. Okay. So I think we can do it w way faster, but we didn't have. But but everyone's. I, I mean, you guys probably have all been waiting for the bridge for a long time. <laughs> uh, we didn't want to wait until we had the technology or until Ethereum <laughs> had the technology. Uh, we wanted to go with the technology that was available right now, and for that we had to do this random sampling approach. Um, and we sort of need this delay because we want to get a, a random number from Ethereum. Uh, consensus mostly, and it's um, that we don't know about when you when 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 you, you so you make some claim and you get some random number later and, and this uh, and we had to wait some time to make sure that you don't know what's going to happen that it's something that the person who submitted the transaction does not know uh, and this is what gave us the, the delay. Um, So, so to give some context there, back when Beefy was designed, uh, like uh, I, I'm not sure if like the um, BLS 381 precompile was even on the roadmap, and its surrogate isn't in sight. It has been there for five years. Yes. So, so, so okay. So this, 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 this is this is the fun thing. Uh, we could have uh, there's a signature scheme. That this BLS signature scheme allows aggregation. It's used by Ethereum in, com in the Ethereum two in the Beacon chain now. It's now live in in Ethereum after the merge. Um, which would allow aggregation and make it better, as opposed to using the, uh, the SecP signatures, which have been the, the default for Ethereum accounts from the beginning. Um, but yeah, the, 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 this, uh, there is a sort of, uh, there is an elliptic curve, which you can do BLS stuff, which is a pre-compile on Ethereum, this BN254, that's been there for years, but uh, the suspicions about its security um, so Ethereum themselves went and, and used this, this more modern curve, BLS12381, the one you invented by Zcash, for their consensus for Ethereum 2. But despite the fact that they use this, you still cannot verify this in the EVM. Uh, there's a pre-compile for this has been, yeah, for five years. 
or something ridiculous like that has, has been, uh, uh, not, uh, you know, uh, as an EIP that's not been included in Ethereum. Um, yeah, we, we, we didn't want to wait, wait for this. It's probably coming within the, with the next Ethereum hard fork. There's a good chance it's finally coming. Uh, but uh, clearly, we, we were right not to wait for it. Yeah, because when the EP is already big enough for me, then it would be uh, <laughs> unstoppable forever. And there's also this point, right, that like at the end, in terms of like gas costs and efficiency, it might still be very much similar to what we are achieving with random sampling. So it will be a much cleaner solution because, yeah, it, it's like a one-shot protocol. Like the Snugbish uh, light client will be like a one-shot protocol. But our like current random sampling protocol is an interactive protocol, which comes with its own uh, subtle issues of concurrency and so on which we have like really tried to uh, address. But uh, yeah, in the end, like it's not so much of like the savings on gas costs, but more of like a cleaner and yeah, uh, a nicer approach with Snagwish like client. Yeah, clearly they all know what they're talking about. <laughs> so, so for most of us, yeah, it's, it's, it's like Greek and Latin. Uh, so no, I don't need this. So. This is all fine, so let's talk about <clears throat> what security guarantees like you know, BFE can, can actually provide, like how much liquidity can, can stay in the bridge. Uh, so most often it, it happens to be the case that if there's a lot of uh, value that is on the bridge, it's like a sitting duck waiting to be like, you know, shot. So, so is that the case with this, uh, this BFE bridge? When does it fail or when does it, when is it easy to crack or, so what are the security guarantees for, for this? Go, all, all three was, can answer, yeah. It was originally designed for proof of work. <laughs> and like there the design was like uh, DMR. You can, you should ah, think. Yeah. Sure. The, 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 the security threshold was like, well, uh, how many blocks would you have to sacrifice in order to like roll the dice successfully on this thing? And then the number to come up there was like, well, uh, you'd have to mine like more, like you'd have to give up mining rewards greater than all the ETH in existence uh, before like you had a good chance of like. Uh... Yeah, I mean, if you want to truly trust this bridge, so, so I mean, it's for context, it's like I, I remember looking into this uh, maybe August two years ago, and then I discovered in the first eight months of, must have been 2021, not 2022, there was like 8 billion stole from bridges. Bridges are a big target. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there has been, uh, and stuff has happened since then. There has been a lot of money stolen from insecure bridges. Um, so we want our bridge to, at least in theory, not be a target. Um, how do we do this? Well, okay, so, so, so each of these blockchains has its consensus algorithm that's supposed to be decentralized, right? This is our trust assumption about Polkadot. This is our trust assumption about Ethereum. Really, what we want is to make no more trust assumptions than we are making about parachain security or about uh, Ethereum security. That this bridge should be secure under exactly the same assumptions and then it will not be the weak point. Uh, you should just attack Ethereum or Polkadot's consensus directly and not the bridge, right? That's the goal. Um, so, so we want to like, you know, uh, assume that uh, the crypto economics here that the in sort of in expectation and attack on the bridge um, should require either at least all the dots in existence or all the Ethereum in existence, or at least all the, the, the dots of Ethereum that are staking, right? This is our, uh, and then this is more expensive. You should just buy a third of the stake of Polkadot or Ethereum and try and attack that chain instead of attacking the bridge. It's cheaper. That's, that's the goal. Um, so how, we can get this, like naively, the way to get this would just be to prove that uh, if we prove to, uh, to Ethereum that something was finalized on Polkadot uh, before we act on anything, any messages coming from Polkadot uh, on, and vice versa on, on Polkadot, we, 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 we wait until something's finalized on Ethereum uh, and we prove that to Polkadot. Of course, the difficulty is uh, it's really expensive to prove to Ethereum that something was finalized on Polkadot. We just argued you can't do it with Grandpa. <laughs> So we add an extra layer of, uh, this extra layer beefy. And in, in beefy, because we didn't want to use any cryptography that you couldn't do on Ethereum, we, we have all the validators do these SecP signatures that sort of default for Ethereum accounts, something you can verify very cheaply in an Ethereum smart contract. Um, 
But we cannot verify 1,000 signatures of that either. So we had to come up with a way of verifying less. Now, this is, this, this is trick. So in Grandpa, it, so Grandpa is this like Byzantine fault-tolerant uh, consensus protocol. We can deal with up to a third of validators uh, behaving any way whatsoever, right? And that gives us uh, some security because this is a loss of stake back, backing these guys. Um, and now in Grandpa, you, you accept something as final when two-thirds of validators vote for it. But in... Um, if you add an extra round, like we do in Beefy, we're assuming that maybe up to a third of validators are bad. But if more than a third of validators vote for something, then maybe one of, the, one of them should be honest. So we have this sort of gap. We, we expect two-thirds of validators to sign something, because maybe a third of them don't turn up. That's our assumption. A third of them could do anything, but maybe they don't turn up. Or they sign something completely different. Uh, but two-thirds are going to sign this thing, but we only need to show that one-third did. And now, if you somehow just took, if, we, if, if you claim that two thirds of people signed something, and you, you check one of those signatures at random, um, if more than a third of people signed something, if less than a third of people signed something, then you, you actually have a probability of a half of, of uh, you know, the probability this thing verifies is less than a half. Uh, and now, if you check a few signatures, the probability that uh, that, that, that less than a third of people signed this thing, so someone honest didn't think this was finalized, goes down exponentially. Um, the difficult part, so this is the random sampling approach. We, 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 you claim that two-thirds of people signed something, we check some guys at random, uh, we check some signatures at random, and uh, the more signatures you check, the less the probability that something bad happens, it decreases exponentially. Uh, and then the really difficult part of the entire protocol is how do we get a random number from Ethereum? Uh, this is the thing which left us with the de delay and, and really complicated the analysis. Um, so you claim something, you wait, there's some randomness you get from Ethereum, you give a few signatures, and then um, there's a very small probability that, uh, that, no, that, that less than a third of validators voted for this on, uh, on Polkadot, and Thus, they're honest, and this is the same assumption, same <coughs> one-third assumption that Grandpa is secure under. So it's as secure as Polkadot, assuming that your randomness uh, is secure on Ethereum, which involves analyzing Ethereum's validator's honesty assumption. That's how it works. Okay. <laughs> okay, so let me quickly summarize that. So basically the bridge is secured by billions of dollars right like in a way yeah. like one third of, of validators on polkadot so they are in active set because uh, you know there's a few millions of, of dot yeah. that is backing them so they are subject to to sort of punishment if, if something yeah, exactly so uh, basically the, the the security proof is more like a crypto economic argument right yeah. so what you really want to say is that uh, basically, the expected outcome of an attacker is negative. So, and here, if the attack is successful, he gets literally like the the market cap of DOT as his uh, like gains. And if the attack is not successful, he gets slashed for his misbehavior. Right. right? And yeah, finally, the argument is that the expected outcome for an attacker, uh, like the expected value of the attack, is negative. So. Uh, a uh, rational attacker would not attempt uh, attacking the bridge. Maybe you had some historical context there for those. May well, we can start with Satoshi Dice, for instance, like which was or is, I don't know if it's still around, like uh, gambling on like Bitcoin, where you then like use like the block hash or like uh, the next Bitcoin block or so to like roll the dice with that. And originally with Beefy, it was done the same way with Ethereum, um, like uh, block hashes, that you would use those as a source of entropy. But of course, the miners can roll the dice on this, uh, but doing so is costly. Uh, so that back then, that was the crypto economic like, incentive for that, well, where you could see, like, okay, what is the cost? You could actually calculate what is the cost for them to roll the dice to, to bias this. And now that we're on uh, proof of stake Ethereum, this doesn't uh, exist anymore, of course, but you have what's called Randall, which is this protocol for everyone has a share and you shuffle and then like, but whoever is like last in the segment can still bias, uh, can decide if they add their entropy or not. Uh, and that's how this becomes biasable. And yeah, so it's, uh, it, it just changed like the kind of crypto analysis that you do going from proof of work to proof of uh, stake. 
But fundamentally, it's about what is the cost uh, for the attacker here. Sounds good. Or how much share do they have to have in the network? Uh, yes, this, the, the, this protocol is so old. We, 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 we were, you know, Ethereum was proof of work when we designed this. <laughs> uh, yes. It was some years later, still proof of work. Um, and then we had to cope with it being proof of stake. It's not fun. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I think we're nearing the end of like, like the session. Uh, I'll ask a couple of more questions and then open it up for audience. So I think, so any sort of trustless uh, infrastructure that we're building um, is also prone to some attack vectors, right? Like from people who actually run the infrastructure. So in terms of like Snowbridge, um, are there any sort of slashing mechanisms for people who sort of not follow the protocol or? Yes, there's an open PR for me from that. Uh, okay, very good. So. <laughs> I'm glad. I, I recommend <laughs> using the bridge once, that is live. <laughs> okay, well, actually, like, no. We're okay. not relying on the relayers. Hello? Go we're, ahead. We're not relying on the relayers for security at all. Okay. It, it should be, um, well, we would like it to be live, right? We would like there to be some people trying to update this sometime, but... Um, uh, Robert's PR is is is, 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 is going to increase slash. It's going to introduce slashing for polka dot validators. Yes. Um, the, the the goal of being a trustless bridge is no. There are absolutely no assumptions on the relayers. There should also be no assumptions on. We even get the, because of this pro, this problem with the rainbow bridge I mentioned. There are no assumptions on Ethereum itself being sensible. If Ethereum has super high transaction fees, then uh, probably the bridge doesn't get updated for ages, but it should still be secure. Um, so. Yeah, that, so, that clarifies a lot. So, so you require one honest relayer to like relay the good thing, mm -hmm. and then it doesn't matter how many relayers are lying to the other sides. Okay. Um, yeah. So those ones don't have any slashing, but the, the infrastructure side and the validators do. Okay. So the relayers are really like permissionless, right? So anyone can spin up a relayer. There's no like stake or deposit or anything of that sort that the relayers have to put in. So it, it's really like, yeah, they're like messengers between the two uh, chains. And uh, you, you have this phrase, right? Like don't shoot the messenger. So it's okay. very similar here that like the relayers don't get like slashed. It's you kind of like find the provenance of the misbehavior back and trace it back to the validator on either of the two chains, and they are the ones who are going to get slashed. Yeah, just for the sake of audience, tell us what relayers are. Yeah, so yeah, so relayers are basically this actors uh, in this like bridge model between two chains who, as as the name suggests, like relay messages from one, one chain bridge. to the other. Mm -hmm. Like specifically in like the Polkadot Ethereum bridge, for example, yeah, they collect the signatures on a particular commitment from Polkadot and then yeah, send it over uh, and submit it as transactions to the Ethereum smart contract. So basically if somebody is trying to send, let's say a million ETH from Ethereum to Polkadot to be able to do very low cost trading or something like that, so, so the relayers are the ones that bring that info and then enable this, this transfer, right? Or no? So if you want to cheat the bridge, like you need, uh, unless you like, are extremely lucky with the random subsampling, you'll need to have like buy-in. No, I'm not talking about cheating. It's just about ah. the job of the relayers. So, so they're the ones who, who bring what's happening on Ethereum to... And vice versa. Yeah. And vice versa. Exactly. Thank you. So now the floor is open for audience. Do you have any questions? Uh, Non-W3F employees first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tell us about the fees. Like in which currency it is paid? What is the microeconomy? Uh, how much basically, and uh, what does it depend on? So uh, the relays um, pay the fee uh, in ETH on the other side, but they get rewarded. Who cares about the relay? I want no, to uh, make a swap. Yes, like wait. <laughs> So the you relay is paid rip, in... Repeat the question. And then. Right. So the question was, like, how much does it cost? In what currency do you pay the fees as a user? So the relayers end up paying, like, this in ETH, but they get paid, rewarded for this on Polkadot. So what they 
you're, the pay you're being relaying from where to where? Uh, relaying from Polkadot to Ethereum. Okay, let's discuss relaying from Ethereum to Polkadot. Well, then you're going to be paying it in ETH. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so th this is definitely kind of beyond the scope of we just have a bridge. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a UX question, and it's probably one that will not be solved right now, but will be solved later. So probably right now, you're going to have to pay in DOT, because you have to pay in something that the bridge understands, but somehow the part of this price is going to be denominated in ETH which creates problems. Like maybe later you'll be able to pay in wrapped teeth, but for you to be able to pay in wrapped teeth, it has to be wrapped teeth. And there's a, there's a chicken and egg problem uh, yeah. that will eventually be solved. So for now, how it's implemented in the bridge is that you're paying it in, in DOT or some other asset, and then there is a governance controlled exchange rate that, like, that is updated regularly for changing what the exchange rate to ETH is. So you see how much like you would be paying in ETH maximally for the relay to do the job, and then they get that converted to DOT plus some reward. Okay, how am I finding it? In dollar today. Tomorrow when something is getting replaced. Let's answer that when the bridge is live. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, no. Uh, actually, if you're a DOT token holder, you'll be able to vote on it because it has to go through like open gov proposal. Let's mistake first. Yeah. <laughs> All right, another question, anybody? I have heard, yeah, I can. Yeah. Uh, two nice words, Bitcoin, NFT, so I'm not decoded. Uh, uh, my question is about, um, so I'm part of Sora, like two years ago we had some guys uh, proposing, okay, we're gonna we make this uh, perhaps uh, Bitcoin transferable to Polkadot, et cetera. So what is the expected uh, time for Bitcoin transferable to Polkadot network? And uh, do you think about with ordinals, NFTs, uh, being transferable towards Polkadot network? The Bitcoin bridge was live for more than a now? year. Yeah, yeah. Like internally. Internet. You can actually bring Bitcoin to Polkadot ecosystem yeah. through. And then, uh, Yeah, so Polkadot is not involved in, in that. Like, so Interlay, which is like an L1, mm -hmm. it has implemented the bridge protocol to Bitcoin, and it is powered by Polkadot. Mm -hmm. So Interlay has what's called IBTC. Mm -hmm. So this IBTC is available on other parachains as well. You can do trading, you can swap it with like other coins. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so Interlay is the parachain that you'll be looking for. And the team that's that is built interlay is also doing something called as build on Bob or something like that, or build on Bitcoin, which is mm -hmm. called Bob. Uh, so they are going to focus more on L2s on Bitcoin itself. Mm -hmm. So, so that's that's like a different project that the team uh, has undertaken. Yeah. And uh, it works the same way for audience. Um, possibly, like it, it's possible to to bring th them based on like what they implemented. But really, we'll have to look into like what kind of design they have for the bridge. Right now, it works for Bitcoin for sure. Yeah. Zero. Yeah. So let's say I'm a DApp developer and I want to use this. So on a higher level, like what what do I need to do? Like, are there any like interfaces I need to implement? Maybe some examples I can use. Yeah. Yeah, I guess, so there is like, uh, we are not maybe the right persons to answer this question, but like, uh, there is like, yeah, fair bit of documentation on like uh, the Snowbridge uh, web page, right? So uh, when the bridge is initially going to be launched, it's only for like uh, ERC20 tokens, but uh, like the design of the bridge is like very general purpose, right? So you can like really think of any application which leverages the fact that you can listen to the finality of one chain over the other. So, 
I mean, I don't I have like many. I know yeah. what's going on. So basically, from Polkadot side, if you're trying to access something on Ethereum, so you'll be writing this this app using like XCM, like that's how you. So Ethereum has like an XCM address, and then you are going to interact on assets on on Ethereum side with that. Um, probably like even the dApps on on Ethereum side, which are trying to access Polkadot's tokens, they'll have to do something similar. Um, but soon, like like the examples will will flow in uh, once the bridge bridge goes live. Actually, you, there's like a Goerli or Ethereum's testnet. Support, support, yeah. Yeah, and Ethereum testnet was already bridged to like Rococo, so you could actually see like like token ERC twenty tokens, like test tokens being like transferred from one one direction to the other. So so there are examples. I think we'll also work on creating a lot more accessible documentation for for app developers. Yeah, so that was my understanding. Right now we can only do ERC twenties, but at some point you'll be able to send an XCM message that calls a smart contract call to happen on Ethereum. And then it's up to you. You can implement almost anything. Which is really cool. <laughs> uh, we should make an awesome DP or awesome bridge that could help save the cost. Yeah. So, so uh, yeah, there, I mean, like, there are two parts. Like, what, what can the bridge do when it launches? And then there's what can Beefy do, like, eventually. And, like, Beefy is, like, really general. Uh, the payload in there has, like, the parallel, parachain headers. So you could really be looking up. In Ethereum, you could be looking up, like, any state in there. Um, but... The implementation will have to catch up with what uh, that scope is. Yeah. All right. With that, I'll end this panel. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, a very small question. Okay. You should take we, the mic. We must be a crypto sum of words, but uh, Beefy finance uh, quite popular Beefy protocol, so it has no relation. To no. <laughs> but we we will I, become more popular than that Beefy yeah, finance yeah. for I, sure. Right. I I do actually have one question maybe for Al. Where does Beefy fit in in the lore of Grandpa and Babes? <laughs> Where does the, the name come from? <laughs> I, I know that's, a different, that's a different question. I mean, they're different, the backronyms came up from, by different people uh, for different reasons. <laughs> uh, so I've got no idea why Andre okay. thought Beefy was an interesting name for a protocol, but he did, and that was enough. And then Grandpa was, was named by Rob Habermeyer, the implementer. Uh, as anyone who went to the first Web3 Summit knows, Gav was trying to push for the name Shaft at one point. Yes. This might have been a bit of a disaster. So uh, Grandpa was much better. Yes, <laughs> we can agree on that. <laughs> All right, thank you very much.